Good morning, colleagues. What an honor and what a pleasure to be invited to speak to young academics. I tried to fake illness and even to say that I am very busy. I came here kicking and screaming, and it's not for lack of trying. So the famous book, The Idea of a University, was published 130 years ago by one of the greatest pedagogues of all time by the name of John Henry Newman. And yet, if John Henry Newman could speak of the idea of a university, it is no longer possible today to speak with such certainty about only one such idea of a university. A century and a half later, there are several contending ideas of what a university is and what a university ought to be. Sometimes several ideas of what a university is jostle and rage for prominence inside one university. I would rather live in a world where there is a multiplicity of university ideas. I would rather work for a university that was open to various ways of being a university. In Newman's world, universities were all about teaching and dissemination and little else. But then there was someone else whose idea of a university was almost diametrically opposed and that is Wilhelm von Humboldt, who is sometimes referred to as the founder, not just of the University of Berlin, which he founded in 1810, but also the founder of the modern university. Von Humboldt's idea of a university revolved around three pillars, the unity of research and teaching, the freedom of teaching, academic self-governance, most of the roughly 20,000 to 25,000 universities in the world today derive a large part of their mission from Wilhelm von Humboldt. Note must be taken, however, that the Humboldtian vision of a university emerges at the height of colonialism. So that by the time the European university arrives in Africa, it is here to assist in the advancement of the colonial project through the creation, first and foremost, of an expatriate elite and only secondarily the creation of a native elite. The native elite is, of course, that group of people who are comically described and painted by uh, Franz Fanon and Sartre in the wretched of the earth. So, the school, the university, the church, and the mosque were key instruments in the creation of what in Portuguese colonies was called the assimilado, uh, black people who qualified to become Portuguese because they were educated, because they spoke Portuguese well, and because they were civilized. Tony Pamukwena has uh, described them so beautifully in her book on Magema Fuse. Now, Mahmoud Mamdani, where he talks about the African University, and this is how he describes the Humboldtian model. The Humboldt model aimed to produce universal scholars, men and women who stood for excellence regardless of context. And in the colonies, such men and women could serve as a native vanguard of civilization without reservation or remorse. The African University, in other words, began as part of the European colonial mission, a precursor of the one-size-fits-all initiatives that we associate with the World Bank and the IMF." End of quote. Very soon, the universal scholar of von Humboldt was confronted by the committed intellectual of Africa in the likes of Walter Rodney at the University of Dar es Salaam. 
People like Franz Fanon in Algeria. People like Amil Cabral of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. People like Eduardo Mondlane in Mozambique. People like Agostino Neto in Angola began to question this idea that universities are here only to produce universal scholars. So, Amil Cabral, Aimé Césaire, and Lepot Sidassingo called for what they called in the French-speaking world le retour au pays natal, the return to the country of birth. They were not talking about an actual country. They were talking about a, an intellectual return to the roots, the return to the source. That the African university must be more connected to the African institutions and African ideas than to Berlin or Bologna in Italy. For these committed intellectuals, relevance was as important, if not more important, than mere excellence. And by relevance, they meant that universities in Africa should take inspiration and cue from African conditions and African institutions. Mahmoud Mamdani suggests that Walter Rodney was in fact the voice of the committed intellectuals of his day, while Ali Mazrui of Makerere became the voice of the universal scholars. Many of those debates are still with us. So, in 2011, John Higgins published his little book titled Academic Freedom in South Africa. I reviewed that book. I expressed concern that how can a book about academic freedom in South Africa talk only about academic freedom and not about gender inequality and not about racial inequality and not about transformation at all. How did he manage to write a whole book from beginning to end and not talk about any of these things? So John Higgins had asked J.M. Kutsia to write the preface to the book. J.M. Kutsia says, but John, if South African universities really value academic freedom as much as you say, they should be prepared to starve for it. In other words, if you want academic freedom, you must not take anybody's money. Whether the money comes from Bill Gates or it comes from Blade in Zimande or government, it doesn't matter. Whoever gives you the money is going to tell you what to do. How do you insist on academic freedom when someone else is paying for you? By then, when we were debating this, fees must fall had not happened. Fees were rising like a helicopter shooting up across the country. After fees must fall, the state is investing more. I don't know for how long it will invest more. But you can be sure that the more the state invests in higher education, the more the state will demand its pound of flesh in one way or the other. Now, let me talk briefly about the vocation of scholarship. So there's not one kind of scholarship. Some of you will know that famous book was written by Ernest Leroy Boyer, Scholarship Reconsidered. So a very fundamental proposition he makes is that teaching is a form of scholarship. So scholarship of discovery, scholarship of teaching, scholarship of integration, scholarship of application. Now, I keep going back to Boyer because there's a way in which he attempts to help us out of the cul-de-sac that we are in when it comes. Is it research or is it teaching that is important? Now... If we think of scholarship as a vocation, we veer towards a vision of scholarship for its own sake. Scholarship as a calling, scholarship as an art, important and meaningful in and of itself. It means that when you sit down and you write an article, you do it slowly because you want to curate it. You want to write it so well. You want to footnote it so thoroughly. You want to check your facts so well. You take your time. It's an art. It's not about the subsidy. It's not about counting how many did you publish this year. It's an art. You want a piece of you to be expressed in that article. Could it ever be a valid expectation of those who choose a life of scholarship that they must approach it as a vocation and a calling? Would it be fair if, if we said... If it's not a vocation for you, 
go away. Are you here as a legal academic because it's a vocation? Aristotle, many, 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 many months ago, in his book on politics, said, it is not at all clear whether people should be trained in what is useful for life, in what conduces to virtue, or in something out of the ordinary. Now, these words of Aristotle may capture the dilemma of universities today. In this statement is captured the platonic ideal of a university whose pursuit of knowledge has ethical, if not moral, consequences. Knowledge that conduces to virtue. Knowledge that does not merely make you a great technician, but makes you a different person a slightly better person than you were before you acquired it. This is another phrase from Aristotle. How useful for life is the research and the scholarship that universities churn out year after year? You'll know the debate between the STEM (coughs) subjects and the NAIL subjects. The STEM being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, NAIL being narrative, analysis, interpretation, and languages. Some people are saying, you don't need the NAIL subjects, really. Not anymore. You just need the, te- the, the technological, STEM, science, technology, engineering subjects. But Aristotle also tantalizingly teases us by proposing that people could be trained in something out of the ordinary, shifting paradigms, seeking to entice and provoke a sense of imagination. So the ambition of universities should be to awaken in the minds of staff and students alike, something out of the ordinary. If we fail to awaken something out of the ordinary, we may make you a good technical lawyer who knows the constitution of the country and the law of the country. We will not have fulfilled Aristotle's ambition. So we are being invited, I think, by Aristotle into a different space, space of restlessness, a space of imagination. The truth of the matter, though, is that universities in the world today are looking more and more the same. The question which each university ought to answer is not how to catch up with MIT and Cambridge, but how can this university be that which only this university can be in the world? Similarly, the question which each faculty ought to answer is not how to match up to some amorphous global best. But the question should be, how can this faculty be that which only this faculty can be in the country and in the world? Similarly, there are millions of legal academics in this country and in the world. The question which each one of you ought to answer is, how can I be part of a team of legal academics who can be that crop of scholars from this country at this time, who only we can be? How can I be that doctor, that professor of law, who only I can be? That, I think, is the challenge over the time.